Welcome everyone. Um, you heard my name, Ken Torino. My day job is with Historic New England. How many of you are familiar with our organization? Great. I hope uh, those of you who aren't, you've got one of my favorite properties pretty close to you, and that's Beauport on Eastern Point in Gloucester. And if you haven't been, please go because it's magnificent. But we have lots of houses up in Newbury too, Spencer Pierce Farm, Essex. Um, Essex County has a lot of our 38 properties you see here and we don't preserve them just to preserve them we preserve them to present um, New England's heritage to the public through school programs through lectures through programs through tours and I just show you some samples of what we do at historic New England um, and today though I'm here to talk about female abolition societies and Christmas um, it says Tufts University there because I also teach museum studies at Tufts and I'm currently working on a book that will be coming out in 2023 on interpreting Christmas at historic sites and museums. So I do a number of Christmas lectures and I've spoken here once before uh, with a different one. So jumping into this and Christmas, the Christmas that we know today is an amalgam of different uh, cultures and religious traditions. It depended on the evolution of Christmas, where you were in the United States, and what backgrounds and what groups of immigrants. If you were out in California, New Mexico, Florida, it, you had the Catholic traditions coming in, as you can see here at this uh, church I was able to visit uh, just right before COVID. And these uh, posadas, an important part of celebrations in both Mexico and California. So these are very much rooted in the religion. While in New England, our English festivities were reacting to the excessiveness that was taking place in England, as you can see here with the gambles uh, by Thomas Rowlandson and here in this other slide, they involved lots and lots of drinking and feasting. And that is why the Puritans coming into New England outlawed Christmas in the 17th century. It was only for a while, but those sentiments stayed with us well into the 19th century. Now, if you were in Louisiana, you were of the Catholic tradition. It was amalgam there, really. Uh, and one of the uh, celebrations, which does go on today, more in restaurants, was an after midnight mass called the Revillian. And that's what you're looking at here, a very elaborate, uh, elaborate meal. So the point is that our Christmas traditions are, are influenced by many, many different cultures and they developed slowly over time. Um, most people in the first half of, uh, half of the 19th century um, learned about the Christmas tree by reading about it and seeing illustrations like this. They did not have them. Um, it was a relatively new tradition even in Germany where um, they brought the tree both to America and uh, other countries. Anyone recognize this couple? Yeah. Victoria and Albert. Uh, Victoria and Albert. You're absolutely right. On the left is the London Evening News from 1848, and on the right, the American publication, Godey's Ladies Book, 1850. 
and you can see a Christmas tree. Again, most people learned about a tree by reading about them, not seeing them until mid-century. And we're going to talk about the abolitionist, female abolitionist role. Now, um, where was Albert from? Germany. Germany. He's helping to bring the Christmas tree to England. So at this time, in the early part of the 19th century that I'm going to focus on, there was no Santa Claus. The Knickerbockers in New York and author Washington Irving and others promoted St. Nicholas, whose feast day is coming up December 6th. And they're promoting him to get away from the rowdiness that the Puritans hated that was still very much prevalent in New York. So Santa, over the 19th century, is going to morph and change. People didn't know what he was supposed to look like. Look at this one. He's got wavy blonde hair. He's clean shaven. Um, people didn't know. He would change and morph, and it was Thomas Nast, the cartoon, that would eventually give us the Santa we know today. There were no Christmas cards. You're looking at some of the earliest. They're about the size of calling cards. Christmas presents were not wrapped. Santa brought them unwrapped. It wasn't until uh, the end of the 19th century that wrapping paper develops in Massachusetts in Maine. Before that, presents were unwrapped. The point is, in the 19th century, Christmas is evolving and changing. And the female abolitionists that you see here, uh, and I will um, name them for just a second, from left to right, left starting at the bottom, Grace Bustill Douglas, Abby Kelly Foster at the top, um, and on the bottom, Angelina Grimke, a Angelina Grimke Weld, and Maria Chapman at the top. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about these women. But they played an important role in the female abolitionist societies in America. And we were particularly strong here um, in New England with these, and many of these, wing and, and obviously the Northeast. Um, to finance the abolitionist cause, women, abolitionist women organized uh, Christmas bazaars that sold donated gifts, many of them handmade, that trumpeted anti-slavery messages to promote uh, emancipation. Now these were happening over, happening over the Northeast. This one from Ohio, I just want to give you a sample. Now this is gl glomming on to a tradition, one of our oldest, and that is by the 1830s, the Christmas season was becoming a popular time for fundraising fairs, mainly by churches. And um, I can give you an example. That is one of our oldest traditions. I live in Nahant. This is going on now. We're in the season of Christmas fairs and bazaars. So that is actually one of our earliest Christmas traditions. And you'll see how the female abolitionists played into that. But let's step back for a minute, because a lot of what I'm going to talk about was fairly radical for these women. Um, let's talk about what the role of women was um, in the 19th century. The cult, of dos the cult of domesticity was a philosophy that sought to define gender roles in the 19th century. A woman's place was in the home here, where her superior virtue was to create a strong, morally uplifting, and uplifting environment for her husband and children. A man's place was in the more corrupt and violent world of work and public affairs. So women were equated with virtue and purity. Uh, middle class and uh, upper class women could devote time to charities like churches, uh, Bible societies, and so on. But the idea that they would engage in public speaking or commerce, or commerce went against dom the domestic sphere and represented a challenge to accepted norms. Women were not expected to speak in public. And when they did, as here, they were ridiculed. This is 1829, British-born reformer Francis White toured the United States and lectured against slavery. That same year, an artist published this cartoon making fun of her. It depicts her standing near a table giving a lecture, but she has the head of a goose. 
The title says, right, quote, deserves to be hissed. According to the artist and many others, woman should not speak in public and the public should not care what she has to say. But other things are changing. In the early 19th century experienced a shift for women in the lower and middle classes. Um, and in the urban centers of the Northeast, they were changing from those household economies that we had, particularly in our region here. And women started entering the workforce to uh, supplement family income. So they worked in mills, they worked as domestic servants or vending on city streets. Now this is the middle class and working class. Uh, the still, upper middle class women focused on social endeavors tied to their husband's employment and continued superior upper mobility. Now abolition, abolitionism in America goes back to the 17th century, but the American beginning of abolition abolitionism as a political movement is usually dated from January 1831 when William Lloyd Garrison published the first issue, you can see the masthead there, of the Liberator. Um, and what I should say, and there's a banner for it, that's in the Massachusetts Historical Society's collecture, uh, collection, um, this was the primary uh, spokesman for the freeing of enslaved people throughout. Um, and at this same time, uh, you were getting the formation of these abolitionist groups. Here's William Lloyd Garrison, originally from Newburyport, Massachusetts, that founded this, uh, the most important paper. He was a prominent abolitionist, journalist, and social, social reformer, best known for the anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator. Uh, which he published in Boston. He did this from 1831 until slavery was abolished. And he rejected the inherent validity of the American government on the basis uh, that its engagement in war, imperialism, and slavery made the government corrupt and uh, tyrannical. He also was one of the founders of the Anti-Slavery Society. Um, here you can see a lecture going on with Wendell uh, Phillips on Boston Common. Um, and Frederick Douglass, the, the runaway slave, was a key leader in this society, the an American Anti-Slavery Society. Um, these societies, these anti-slavery societies, were created uh, throughout the United States to stop slavery. But it was Garrison who paved the way for women to have a key role in the abolition movement. He saw the power they held morally and the numbers uh, to further the cause. cause. He encouraged the women to create anti-slavery societies and these were associated with sewing circles. Now this slide just shows you where some of those anti-slavery societies were. They were throughout the Northeast uh, not in the South, as you might expect. Um, and so I'm going to give you a couple examples of these female uh, abolitionist societies uh, because many of them were right in our backyard. Uh, they played, the female abolitionists, a key role. In the 1830s, they sprung up in New England and the Middle Atlantic both in cities like Cincinnati, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Rochester, Providence, and Salem, as well as in counties like the Ashtabula County in Ohio, female anti-slavery societies, and even in small towns like Ashburton, Mass. Uh, the female anti-slavery anti society of Salem, and these are their records books at the Peabody Essex Museum holds, uh, was founded in 1832. It was the first all-female anti-slavery organization established in the U.S. This groundbreaking group was made up entirely of African-American women. Uh, it was established by and for free black women. Uh, they organized and addressed a variety of issues. They had lectures. Um, they also had sewing circles, which we'll talk about, and so on. So that's a very important and early group. But just to show you, they were around the Northeast. Here's one from Philadelphia. 
um, sponsor, they sponsored fairs to raise money uh, for Frederick Douglass and for the Liberator. A lot of these societies funded the Liberator. Uh, that's Lucretia Mott, uh, who is mentioned in the sign that you can see there. That's 1833. Uh, these are some of the records that survive uh, of that society. And let's meet two of their other founders, uh, African-American women, Grace Bustille Douglas and Sarah Douglas, her daughter. Um, they were originally Quakers, and the Quakers play a big part in the abolitionist movement. The Quakers were against slavery uh, as part of their religion, uh, but it gets more complicated because they did not expect women to take, play, to take part or met in the abolition move, movement themselves. So many, like Sarah, left the Friends group and joined others' churches and to participate. Uh, these women befriended uh, Lucretia Mott, you saw on the previous slide, and the Grimke sisters uh, to lead the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society. Um, and they formed this because, it's very complicated, because women, at at certain times were not allowed in the men's anti-slavery societies. So they had to form their own. So it's very, very political. And just to show you another one, um, another local example is this one's from Lynn in the Lynn Museum, a certificate for the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, Lynn's abolitionist women created their own organization because they were unwelcome at the men's anti-slavery meetings. Um, and 1835, as many as 180 women from Lynn, and Nahant was part of Lynn then, uh, and so was Swampscott, be belonged to this groups. Uh, these groups held their own fairs and supplied goods to the Boston Fair I'll be talking about. Um, and let's go on here. So one of the things these women did very early on and chiefly in the 1830s, lacking the right to vote and establish elections, women sought to influence Congress through their constitutional right to petition. Congress received hundreds of thousands of petitions like this, you can see signed, that addressed all aspects of the anti-slavery issue, including the slave trade, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, expansion of slavery in the territories, and so on. These petition drives represented women's most important grassroots work for abolitionists in the 1830s. Um, and that will change with the fairs. Now, most of the female abolitionists form sewing circles, and you can see that here. Typically, one member of the group would read anti-slavery literature, maybe out of the Liberator, while others sewed and made products to sell, uh, both locally and nationally, um, at fairs. Um, and here you can see a broadside, and this is from Weymouth, Massachusetts, where the women were advertising their sewing society and a social party fair that they were uh, going to be selling goods at. And just to show you an example of a quilt made at one of these sewing societies, I'm going to come back and talk about that um, a little bit more detail. Maria Weston Chapman of Weymouth was an active author, editor, and ardent abolitionist. In 1833, she helped found the Female Anti-Slavery Society in Boston, and that had both white and black members. The organization looked for ways to support the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, which was a local branch of a national society. The Anti-Slavery Fair, let me show you the constitution here of the Female Anti-Slavery Society. These were often published in the Liberator, so other groups wishing to form could use these um, to help them. And if you read what's the bottom part in bold, to aid and assist in this righteous cause of freeing the enslaved as far as lives within our power. Now, the anti-slavery fair was Chapman's invention. 
she decided a fundraising fair would be a good way to help the cause. In 1834, with her sisters and friends, notably Elizabeth Southwick, Louisa Long, and Lydia Marie Child, the Female Society organized the first of many anti-slavery fairs to help raise money for the cause. Women from here and abroad, you'll see, donated quilts, articles of clothing, needlework, and other crafts for the fair. The earlier crafts, uh, fa the earlier fairs were more handcrafty. And you can see here on this list where lady societies are send, uh, where they're sending goods from. Uh, receipt of articles from all these. And this one shows you as far away as Washington, D.C. And you'll see later um, that they came from either farther, farther a fear a field. Okay, here we go. So let me give you another example of one of these fairs um, here. Which one are we looking at? Oh, okay. Uh, it, this Massachusetts anti-slavery uh, fair, this is a listing of the women who helped to organize. It, it, was, it had been decided upon consultation and advice with the Friends of the Cause in various parts of the state to hold a fair of 1840 during Christmas week and to spare no exertions to make it a pleasant and profitable occasion to the good old cause, which every year's efforts makes dearer and dearer. So the female abolitionists are starting to um, learn from those earlier Christmas fairs I mentioned that were being done by churches. And this was, um, again, not just in New England. This is from Victor, New Hampshire, off to, uh, excuse me, Victor, New York. Um, and it was also to capitalize on the growing um, gift giving that was now becoming associated with Christmas. In the early years, you saw people giving gifts as often in New Year's as Christmas. Eventually, Christmas would take over. Um, these uh, fairs, like this one in Lynn, the Lynn Anti-Slavery Fair, uh, was an opportunity for women to correspond with each other. And here you can see Lyd Lydia Marie Child, Carolyn Weston, secretary. So they're corresponding with these major women in the movement. So they're learning from that. Women are also learning um, organizational skills for these fairs. So again, women coming out of the home and doing something like this was fairly radical. Um, and here, another sample of a local anti-slavery fair in Weymouth, this one in Worcester. And here you might note at the bottom that they are getting rare beauties from England, Ireland, and Switzerland suitable for New Year's presents, okay? Again, New Year's was mentioned in these earlier years as often as Christmas. And here's um, one more example, All right? And this is uh, one from Winter Street. Um, and the advertisement for this said that there was an opportunity to purchase articles of use and beauty. Um, and among them are the elegant donations of friends in France, Switzerland, and Great Britain. So there were abolitionist groups in those countries that were supporting these fairs and shipping over uh, goods. Female networks across, um, were not, or as I said, were across this country and Europe. Now, the early Boston fairs uh, were held in private homes. But with their growing popularity, they moved out to larger venues like Avery Hall. And then here, as you can see in this gazette, the anti-slavery fair in Fennel Hall. And here's another version of that. Um, an 1834 anti-slavery fair was uh, held in a home, home from the previous December raised $360. Um, in December 1835, they extended the fair to two days at another home on Beacon Hill. And by the third year, it had grown so big that it was held in larger spaces like these that you see here. 
From January on, women knitted and sewed goods to sell in these sewing circles, and abolitionist societies around the state, con uh, state competed to contribute the most items. By 1838, the fair raised more than $1,000, and by 1844, it was so big it had to be held in, as you see, Faneuil Hall. Here's just some sample of tickets. There was an admission to be paid as you entered. And now I want to talk a little bit about one of their marketing ploys. Uh, in, it was a local fair or Sunday school in the first half of the 19th century that most people encountered their uh, this, uh, Christmas tree. Remember, I told you they read about them first. So where are they going to see them? It's going to be, this is from a Sabbath school book where you see the tree. This is one uh, from a church festival to get in and you would see a Christmas tree. That was a big deal. Um, that was a huge deal. And here an advertisement, and this is from Middlebury, Vermont, and you can see that they're advertising a Christmas tree with concert exercises because Christmas trees were new. They were something that people were unfamiliar with and people at this point did not generally have them in their home. So the female abolitionists were smart. Um, they started advertising, you could come and see a Christmas tree at our fair. Uh, they promoted the use of Christmas trees in their publications, like the Liberator, which was distributed nationally. Um, and they called it a new attraction, a brilliant spectacle. And here you can see Crystal Kindle Bomb, you know, so they're using the German because it was, again, the German immigrants who are bringing the Christmas tree into Pennsylvania, where we, f we have the first documentation of Christmas trees around the early 1800s. Again, it is not popular. So what I'm going to show you is, this is the very first image we have of a Christmas tree. This is in the uh, Philadelphia countryside. It was done by a German, John Lewis Crimmel. Uh, and it, uh, he was an immigrant. This is in the collection of the Winter Tour Museum. And you can see just it's a small tabletop tree. What you're looking at here is the very first printed image in America we have of a Christmas tree. And it was published in Boston. Boston was a major publishing center. So we played a big role in getting the word out about the Christmas tree. That was in 1836. And it, the story um, was written by a German immigrant, Hermann Bochum. Um, and this was part of what was called a gift book. And you're going to hear more about those. So um, these early trees uh, were usually set atop a table, as you can see here decorated with toys, candy, fruit, ribbon, garlands, and candles. Now, a female abolitionist who helped to promote the Christmas tree in her writings was the woman you see on the left, Elizabeth Martineau, who was an English abolitionist. Uh, she comes over to America, and she goes to Harvard professor um, Fallen's, uh, Charles Fallen's house. He was a reformer in abolitionism. That's what brought them together. And on New Year's Eve, she was, um, she was present uh, at a new spectacle, which she called, quote, the German Christmas tree. And this, was, uh, this actually took place in, on New Year's in 1836. And she publishes a book of her travels in America in 1838. Uh, that's, again, getting the word out about Christmas trees. And I'll just read you a bit. She said, it really looked beautiful. The room seemed in a blaze, and the ornaments were so well hung that no accident happened except that one doll's petticoat caught fire. Uh, there was a sponge tied to the end of a stick to put out any uh, blaze, and no harm ensued. Uh, the children poured in. In a moment, every voice was hushed. The faces were upturned to the beautiful, uh, in, upturned to the blaze, all, all eyes wide open. 
uh, every voice hushed. It looked beautiful. The room seemed in a blaze. Um, yeah, and that's it. So uh, again, I mentioned Christmas presents were not wrapped. They were hung on a tree or if too big, set down by the tree. So here we have Harriet Martineau writing about Fallen's Christmas tree. Now, there, for many years in the Fallen Church where he went to preach in Concord, uh, claims that this was the first Christmas tree in America. Well, we know it wasn't because this is 1836. Uh, it was among the earliest Christmas trees, certainly in New England. Now, these trees were decorated with ornaments like this, which you might buy at one of these abolitionist fairs. They were usually homemade, so probably done in a sewing circle. Uh, but ladies uh, magazines like Godey's or magazines like Harper's Weekly had instructions like this on how you could make them. So again, first ornaments handmade. It's not until later in the 1860s that you start getting um, glass ornaments. And guess where they're coming from? Germany. Germany, yeah. Whole villages were devoted to making those. And I just show you some of the candle holders uh, that could be on these trees. Uh, it's just to end this loop about the Christmas tree. It's not till the end of the 19th century, 1870s and 80s, that you start seeing floor to ceiling trees like this. This was in the Upton's family home better known as the House of Seven Gables uh, in Salem, where I also uh, work. <laughs> uh, so I have to put my plug in for the, for the gables. There you go. The Christmas tree, as I said, was a new attraction, a brilliant spectacle. The Liberator reported that the tree, quote, was completely loaded with Christmas gifts, brilliant with sparkling cones and gilded butterflies, and every branch bristling with wax candles. Now, uh, how many of you have actually seen a Christmas tree with real candles on it? And where was that? It was in a woman's house in uh, Wenham, who was German. Who was German, right. And where, where were you, ma'am? A friend in North Andover, who <coughs> was originally from Europe. Originally from Europe. And my friends on the haunt do it. And if you have never seen one with real candles, it's, it's spectacular. It is really beautiful. So you have to think, someone who's never seen a Christmas tree, seeing all these candles and lights, it's really a special, a special attraction. And it was so special that these, this is an image of some, the fairs got so popular that you had crowds like this. The night the tree was unveiled, the crowds were so great that many could not get into this fair. Now, female abolitionists also played a role in the use of greenery. Greenery was first used in churches. This is actually King's Chapel in Boston in 1851. And here we have another image of it. There were descriptions of, and people advertised in the paper about you could go to a church and see the greenery. Greenery was not used in houses at this point. But be, it becomes an industry, actually. Frances Drake of Lemister, Mass., wrote in 1843 that she sent in greens for decorating at the Boston Fair, fair along with hand-sewn goods to be sold. So these are women, again, making things, but also selling, uh, sending greenery to decorate the halls. It's not until much later that you start seeing greenery creeping in, and just in little ways, into houses. This is a Winslow Homer engraving from later in the 19th century, uh, as is this. So the women, by decorating their fairs, played a uh, big role in the promoting. Now, women's groups were, in a sense, cashing in on the growing commercialization of Christmas. And I have to tell you, we all lament the fact that Christmas is commercial. It was there from the beginning. Absolutely. Uh, here's an 1852 bazaar ad in, next to goods for the holiday. So you see uh, an ad for the anti-slavery bazaar, but advertising all of these wares, which I'll just let you read. Um, 
One woman, in writing about the fair, she said, I hope they're going to make, quote, heaps of money. Uh, and just to show you, it wasn't just the women um, who were doing this. They're picking up on this movement. This is an ad up the top from Salem, Massachusetts, advertising Christmas and New Year's. Remember, I said New Year's was as much as Christmas at this time. And here's an ad from, that was printed in Boston and it was also in the newspaper, Holiday and New Year's Presents. And it goes on uh, to state what you might got, get. And just to show you, um, as the popularity of the holiday began to grow, businesses began advertising their wares as presents. The earliest advertisements, as I said, referred to New Year's gifts as often as Christmas. In these early advertisements, the seeds of the commercialization of the holiday were sown. Such holiday customs as the Christmas tree and Santa Claus, um, intimately connected as they both are with gift giving, might not have flourished to the extent that they did without some economic impetus. And this was mass production of inexpensive goods. And that brought goods within the reach of the general public. Merchants and the female abolitionists were not slow to take advantage of uh, these opportunities presented to them. And here you can see other goods um, that were being advertised. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, a prominent author, Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, a prominent abolitionist, she wrote, quote, oh dear, Christmas is coming in a fortnight and I've got to think up presents for everyone. Dear me, it is so tedious. Everybody has gotten everything that, that can be thought of. And there are wa worlds of money wasted at this time of year and getting things that nobody wants and nobody cares for after they are got. So not everyone was supportive of this new tradition here. Um, so these fairs contributed to the commercialization of the um, holiday. The Liberator in 1836 wrote, an opportunity thus will be afforded, not only to those who wish to contribute to the cause of the slave, but all who wish to procure a variety of Christmas and New Year's presents. Um, so this is putting women right in the bustling world of buying, selling, and consuming. Again, a big shift from, um, from what they were supposed to be doing. And this is from one of the Liberator's articles. It's a floor plan of the 19, 1839 Abolitionist Fair and with booths, booths hosted by sister societies from across Massachusetts and beyond. And I'll show you a, a, a detail so you can actually read some of these names. Um, there were also, the hall would be decorated, there were banners. Uh, Okay, let me show you that. So you can just see. Uh, Nantucket is here. Uh, Boston, Boston. And some of the big names like Miss Chapman I've, West, I've mentioned. I noticed Stoneham's over there. Plymouth, Weymouth, uh, New Bedford, uh, and so on and so on. Um, I did a little checking and I couldn't find one for Beverly. Um, and I did check with the Beverly Historical Society. I believe some of the women in Beverly belong to the Salem groups. Um, and even New York was, was uh, represented in here. Now I want to show you some of the items that they set, uh, sold. And I mentioned a lot in the earlier fair were handmade. Uh, this um, Min Melissa uh, Emmington of the F Lowell Female uh, Abolitionist Society in 1834 wrote, this is a handkerchief in the collection of the Peabody Essex. Uh, these handkerchiefs were produced in the hope, quote, that the sad picture of human suffering these two truly portrayed may kindle in the breast of many a freeborn happy child a glow of heartfelt sympathy sympathy and cause the tears to flow and the infant offering to arise to heaven in behalf of those downtrodden ones. So here I blew up so you can see what they're showing, you know, a slaver whipping children uh, and so on to teach others about the horrors of slavery there. Okay. 
here's another one. I mentioned earlier a quilt. Um, so uh, documented artifacts made for and sold at the queer, uh, fairs are relatively rare. This quilt was made in 1842 by Quaker women of Clinton County, Ohio and Wayne County, Indiana. These women had been disowned by the mainstream Quaker meeting due to their anti-slavery activities. Remember I told you earlier, Quakers were against slavery but did not want women out there publicly protesting. Um, the women who made this quilt were all members of this uh, anti-slavery society. Give you another example. Abby Kelly uh, Foster was an American abolitionist and social reformer, uh, born in 1811 and died in 1887. She was a Quaker. She comes to Lynn and joins the a a abolitionist movement there. Uh, and she helped uh, with the female anti-slavery society of Lynn, was elected to uh, one of the committees and um, so on. She was passionately carried out her assignments. She put, sent petitions and um, of the limit, Lynn women to the federal government. And uh, she eventually ends up in Worcester where she marries. Her site becomes a home on the Underground Railroad. It's a National Historic Landmark now that the Park Service oversee. This is a quilt that she made that's in the, and you can read the lines, that's in the Worcester Historical Society's collection. So just another example of things that were made. Lydia Marie Child, I've mentioned her before, a very prominent abolitionist, one of the founders of the Boston Female Abolitionist Society and the Anti-Society uh, Fair. She was born in uh, Medford and she was an author, poet, and abolitionist. Well, I show you her image because we, where I work at Historic New England, have this quilt, which I show you earlier. The January 2nd, 1837 issue of The Liberator describes articles that had been made for sale at a recent anti-slavery fair. Included was a description of a quilt, which we believe this, made of patchwork and small stars and a transcription of the poem in its center. Um, and this was in uh, December 1836. And here is the poem in the center. And it reads hand inked, it was hand inked, mother, when you are around your child, you clasp your arms in love. And when you are gr grateful, joy you raise, your eyes to God above. Think of the Negro mother when her child is torn away. Soul for a little slave, oh then, for that poor mother pray. So that is one of the prizes in our collection. One of the other things we know from these lists is that they sold stationery like this with the imagery you see there. So letterhead was sold at these fairs. And I included this because Angela Emily, uh, Emily Grinke Weld, who I introduced you to before, she was actually from a Southern uh, slaveholding family. And she and her sister became moved to the North and became prominent abolitionists um, and brought up their um, niece and nephew who were African-American, uh, fathered in slavery um, by a, a woman in slavery to the North and educated them and brought them into the anti-slavery movement. So this is actually, I think it's really fun. It's a letter from Angelina to uh, the Queen of Great Britain uh, in 1837 asking for her help um, in uh, outlawing slavery. These are other things. These are wafers. These were used to seal letters in the 19th century. And there's a whole sheet, but I think you can read some of these. Um, and they were, again, to promote the abolitionist cause. Um, and here you see, I think you can read them. Uh, the owners of slaves are licensed robbers and not the just proprietors of what they claim, and so on and so on. 
Uh, let me show you a couple of the banners that would have been hanging in these halls. This is in the collection, this in the next, in the Andover Historical Society, probably made by the Smiths and Doves of Andover, a company there, who were both active abolitionists and appear frequently in the Liberator. So these things were all basically propaganda to promote abolitionism in the halls. Uh, and to anyone visiting these Christmas fairs. They also sold items like this, pot holders, any holder but a slave holder. They were frequent items we found. Um, this is a list uh, from the Ladies Anti-Slavery -Soci Anti Society of Perth, Scotland to Maria Weston Chapman. So these um, were being sent to our fair in Boston uh, to help with the effort. Um, that many of the goods, like I'm gonna show you, captured the abolitionist beliefs. So let's look at what some of the other items sold. This was a reticule, a small bag. Uh, this is in the collection of the v Victoria and Albert. Uh, it usually closed with a, a drawstring and decorated with embroidery or beading. So here you can see, again, the image of the poor slave. And on the back would be a uh, poem, um, and I'm, I won't read you this one for time, but I want to show you some other samples of these bags that were sold here in America. Uh, the bags were also used to carry basically what might be called propaganda against, um, against slavery, which had already by the 1830s been outlawed in England. Okay. This is in the Lynn Museum's collection, a pin cushion. Again, look at the symbolism um, on, on these goods. So these were sold at these fairs. Also, all, also in the Lynn Museum collection uh, would be a handy tool, but it was also an expression of a woman's um, political conviction. Right. And here's a sample from the uh, sampler in the collection. Uh, it's done by Hannah Bloor. It's in the collection of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Now, while the purpose of these fairs was to raise money towards abolitionist cause that were working to end slavery, some women worried that the emphasis on highly sought after British or fancy goods would make people forget the true purpose of the fair. As the tree be fair became more popular, there was a marked shift away from the marked goods, like I've just shown you, to unmarked goods, which reinforced the concern that people were forgetting the purpose of the fair. Now, this is in the historic New England's collection, but it's uh, part of a set that belonged to James Buffum, a Lynn Quaker, and in the early 1840s, he befriended Frederick Douglass. When Douglass published his autobiography, which he wrote in Lynn, uh, and he signed it, Lynn Mass, 1843. He was a runaway slave. There were people hired to bring him back. He revealed his location. So he was in risk. So Douglas was sent to Britain with Buffum, Buffum um, and later, and this was very controversial, Douglas's um, freedom would be bought. And there were people who were very angry who said, why are you buying you know, his freedom? He was born, of, he sh he was, anyone born should be free. Uh, family tradition says that this tea set was bought at one of the Boston anti-slavery fairs. And this, also in the Lynn Museum collection, belonged to the Breed family, a uh, small brown knotted silk ch uh, change purse uh, with brown bead designs. It's in French. The translation is, remember the slave. And the Breeds were prominent abolitionists. Um, I wanted to show you just the symbolism that you're seeing over and over. This is a medallion that was meant to be worn by both men and women, and it could be incorporated into bracelets and other jewelry and used to also to decorate snuff boxes. Now, this is some of the goods that are coming over from England. This is a piece of Wedgwood. I think many of you know that name. And it's modeled after this popular image of an enslaved man in change, in trade, in excuse me, in chains. You see that again here in this uh, cologne bottle. Copies of Wedgwood's, 
Wedgwood's anti-slavery medallion circulated in many different media as evidenced by this cologne bottle, which was likely produced around 1833. Those attending the Boston Bazaar in 1849 could find, quote, cologne bottles of old sev, scented oil, and Paris soaps, as well as perfumes. And that was 1849 and the Liberator. And here we go. Now, I mentioned, um, well, maybe I didn't mention, one of the biggest gift items in uh, the 19th century were gift books. You can see juvenile books. Books were on the cutting edge of a commercial Christmas, making it more than half of items advertised as Christmas gifts, writes historian Stephen Nissenbaum. Publishers came up with a new product, a new literary genre known as the gift book. And that's what you're looking at one here. It says Christmas, New Year, and birthdays. Well, I will tell you, um, the female abolitionists were right on top of this. Uh, the Liberty Bell, you can see here, um, was an annual abolitionist gift book edited and published by Maria Chapman Weston, sold to the, at the National Anti-Slavery Bazaar, organized by the Boston Female Anti-Slavery anti Society. And it was named after the symbol of the American Revolution. Now, Chapman got major people to write for these. Names that I know you'll recognize, and I've mentioned Lydia Marie Child, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, for example, Harriet Martineau, and so on. Um, people attending the fair could buy these books as a souvenir of their visits. And it wasn't just at the Boston fairs. The ladies in Rochester, uh, the Rochester Anti-Slavery Fair, where Frederick Douglass had moved, um, uh, set it up their own fairs. And they produced a gift book called Autographs for Freedom, published in 1853. And, and, and that, it was an anthology of literature. Um, and this includes the only published fiction of Frederick Douglass called The Heroic Slave. Now, um, and here, this is just showing you something from the Rochester Female Abolitionist Society, which was a prominent group in America. Now, the women, the abolitionists, were tying in with another national movement. They were trying to help the enslaved, to free the enslaved. At the same time, we, other people in America, are looking to do service and help the poor. So you have the rich man's uh, Christmas here from a mid-19th century illustration compared with the poor man's meager Christmas. Now, helping others less fortunate than ourselves becomes equated with Christmas, helping the poor. And that is popularized in Frederick Douglass's uh, no, Frederick Douglass's, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, you see here. And you know that story well. And anyone know where Charles Dickens gave the first public reading in America of A Christmas Carol? Oh, I know. It's at the Tremont Temple in Boston. Close. Oh. Close. But there, he did do something. He did. Yeah. But the first one was... Ah, good guess. You're right in the neighborhood. You're on the same street. Yeah. Parker House. Oh, that's right. It was, it right was the Parker the House. It was right across the street. It was right there that he did. So people are, you know, learning that, you know, we should, at the Christmas season, be doing better for others. And that ties into what the, free, the Female Abolitionist Society did. Also, in America, um, the Christmas was being promoted, quote, as an occasion for mutual good feeling, family gatherings, as you see here, the whole family gathered around the patriarchs in the center, and the exercises of those charities so blessed in the sight of heaven. And that's helping out others. Now, Christmas becomes more of a family-centered event. This is 1858. And it was during this period that attitudes towards childhood changed. It, in the past, in the 17th century, 18th century, children were treated as little adults to be, uh, to be educated. You weren't really caring so much about 
their enjoyment as childhood. It was during this period that Attitudes Victorian towards childhood changed. It now became a special time, and the central purpose of the family was to provide for the instruction of the children, but also their happiness, um, as you can see here. Um, and in the female abolitionist society, they specifically gear the Christmas tree towards children, right? Um, and um, in the 1850s, the Glasgow Female Anti-Slavery Society sent children's clothing and accessories to the Boston Bazaar. Um, children could also take home an ornament from the Christmas tree. Now, just to show you a couple examples, these are typical gifts. The one on the left was to Annie Jenkins for Christmas at the Lynn Museum. Uh, this was a gift from uh, Santa to Edith Longfellow, Henry Longfellow's, Henry, Long, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's daughter in 1853. But at the abolitionist fairs, they didn't miss the opportunity to teach. These are um, some items that were sold to instruct children. This was a game called Uncle Tom's Card Game. And players are dealt cards and then decide which family they would like to compete. So bringing a family together. But once a player holds all the cards in their family, they must ask other players if there is a Legree, the villain, the slave owner, who wants them to give up their cards and break up the family. So they're teaching children what can happen with the breakup of enslaved families. They, at the Philadelphia Fair, we know for a fact, uh, they sold the anti-slavery alphabet, I'll let you read that, published in 1846. So these were um, published by a Quaker, um, and this was, would have been read in anti-slavery and abolitionist households to attempt to inform the next generation about abolist, abolitionist politics and incite activism in children. I'll let you read this one too. So the abolitionist fair was, had a very long run. And I, I hope to give, you, to give you an idea of what, why and how it contributed to Christmas. But what happened with the fair? In 1858, Maria Weston Chapman decided to cancel the annual anti-slavery bazaar in favor of an annual subscription service. Uh, let, quote, she said, like an old broom, it ought to be replaced. I have invented an instrument to replace it. The 25th annual anti-slavery subscription festival to form so nearly on the old bazaar pipe that the change will only be perceptible for the better. Uh, and she goes on about that. What happened is she did this on her own. She did not consult with other people and many people were upset. This new subscription service, though, was a success and raised $2,200 more than the final bazaar. Uh, yes, there, you'll recognize some local names in there. You saw that, Loring? Yep, you will see nor, North, uh, North Shore names there. Um, Chapman said that the fair had become passe. She argued that the anniversary, an exclusive invitation-only soiree featuring music, food, and speech speeches was more a courant and would raise more funds than the bazaar. Um, so this was just one aspect of these anti-slavery societies, these fairs. They continued to do lectures. Um, Christmas continued to develop, but so did the cause of abolitionism. When the Civil War comes, women uh, switched their efforts uh, to the cause uh, and did things like, with their sewing circles, make goods. You can see socks here being handed out during the Civil War. And they, uh, this is an illustration from 1862 in Harper's Weekly. It's a drawing titled, The Influence of Women. In the engraving, engraving, women fulfill many important war, uh, war effort roles. Sewing shirts and uh, knitting socks, 
as part of the Sanitary Commission, washing clothing for sailing, sail, soldiers as stamp aid, stamp, excuse me, camp aides, as well as acting as Sisters of Charity, ministry to soldiers in the field hospitals, and helping wo wounded soldiers write letters back. Uh, this shows the uh, culmination of women's efforts to, be, to take a more active and public role in the medical field, serving as nurses treating women wounded soldiers during the Civil War. So the female abolitionists paved the way for women in many ways, in many walks of life. Um, this is one I wanted to just show you, uh, Maria W. Uh, Stewart. Uh, she was an abolition, abolitionist and women's rights advocate, lived in Boston on Joy Street. She was African-American. Uh, she was also the first black American woman to write and publish a political manifesto calling for black people to resist slavery and exploitation. Many of these women that I showed you, um, oh, there she is, sorry. Um, there she is. Um, many of these women um, went on, and I'll go back here, that I showed you earlier, went on to have roles in the suffragette movement in helping to get the vote for women. Um, so as I wrap up and say, women did play a big role in the Christmas we know today, as you see here and here. We wouldn't have had um, the development of the Christmas tree or gift giving without the female abolitionists. Uh, we wouldn't have had the Christmas uh, tree of today. So I hope I showed you their role in the development um, that they had and want to just wish you all a Merry Christmas. So thank you.